All right, good morning, everybody. No. God, hell you, you beat me to it. All right, uh, let's give a couple of minutes for people to uh, roll in. Oh, kind of cute. You see my demon and the uh, top of my shelves in my, my office. It's a very cute demon. Let's see if I can fix this. Mm. There we go, that's better. All right, so while we wait a couple of minutes for everybody to roll in, uh, now's a great time to ask questions. If anyone has any about the material we covered on, what day is it today? Wednesday, uh, on Monday. Oh, sorry, I struggle to remember what day of the week it is at times, to be honest. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, um, about the material we covered, the flow of information, mutation, stuff like that. Uh, please feel free. Uh, good question, Jade. So is homework set up like the test or is it different? So, well, the homework's really designed to kind of help you study, right? And prepare for the exam. So it's not, it's not exactly like it. Some some of the format of the questions will be similar, right? So multiple choice, multiple answer, uh, maybe even kind of pairing, you know, making like different words go to the right places, stuff like that. Um, so in that sense, yeah, in a way it is actually. Um, also, you're you've probably seen in homework one. There's a, a chi squared problem. Right, which we haven't come to yet, so don't worry about it right now. But uh, there'll, for example, there'll be stuff like that in the exam. So in a way, it is. I mean, it's not intended to be like that, right? I mean, uh, its intention is to really help you study and figure out what stuff you don't know as well as you think you do. Um, so that's really the purpose. But in a sense, it will get you prepared for the exams as well. But in a kind of a fairly, you know, let's say limited sense, you know, it's just like another set of questions, really, like the ones at the end of the chapters in the textbook. You know, just ways of testing your information or your knowledge or your understanding, things like that. Also, actually, I've had, I don't know whether from this class or the other one, um, I've had people actually, or students, sorry, well, whatever you want to call them, um, actually, email me questions about homework questions, right? And that's totally cool. So if you want to I'd advise starting these things like a little earlier than the, the day that they're due, and that will give you a chance to, you know, email me, ask me, um, like, I don't understand, or am I on the right track, or does this look right, that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to tell you the answer, but I will help you get the right answer. Um, as a center, no and no and yes. So you don't need a lab coat and goggles for lab today. It's a it's a dry lab, and it's in Madler three two two. So oh God, if I can type, never realised how useful uh, being able to use your index finger is when it comes to typing. All right, so. Any other questions, queries, stuff like that? Oh, yum, yum, yum. Um, for the homework, I've only opened up the first one. Uh -huh. All of those homeworks listed, are those all for the first exam or are those for the full semester? No, they're for the full semester. Oh, OK. So there, I'll get to your question in a second, Melissa. I'll just answer Amber's first. Um, so they're spaced ideally not always perfectly but they're spaced so that they kind of go over the material you covered in class before the homework's due the alignment isn't perfect but it's as, it's as good as i can get it 
Um, so if you do a, like, if you enter homework one, for example, and you're like, uh, Kai squared, what the hell is that about? Uh, don't worry about it because we'll be covering that um, maybe the end of this week, um, beginning of the next week, uh, but certainly before the homework's due, right? So it's kind of that, that kind of like, they're like little quizzes in a, in a sense, right? Kind of in, but you get to do them at your own pace. Uh, Melissa, no, you don't need to bring anything with you to lab today. Just yourself and a mask. And we'll be handing out safety forms for people to sign, um, but you'll be doing that in lab. Cool. Anybody have any other questions? Awesome source. Right. So we finished up the. Um, I've got a real tilted chair. I have to get. I haven't sat in this chair for bloody months. Um, we're going to uh, get going on Mendelian inheritance today. Let's get that down so it's not quite so bright. Actually, at my office, which is kind of funny. Um, yeah, that's right, um, Jim. If you're in the B lab, today's your your day. If you're in the A lab, then it's next next Wednesday. For people that are in my lab section, uh, your uh, Mr. Penny's is is different. Pardon me. Okay, so essentially, we're going to be uh, starting on PowerPoint three, which is um, Mendelian genetics. And really, what I want to do is kind of impress on, on everybody that when we're talking about Mendelian genetics, what we're really talking about is probability, right? What's the probability that a given offspring will inherit a particular uh, version of a trait, right? So that's really what we're talking about. It's really just math. It's fairly simple math. Right, but it's still math nonetheless. And really what we're trying to do is kind of map out how traits and different versions of genes, alleles and is the, the word for that, how those get transmitted down through generations. Right. And so the like the one thing that I always like to talk about is. I often use examples of my my own family, right? But I'm sure in your own family, you're um, there's like familial traits, right? You know, it's kind of stuff that's passed down from generation to generation that you know kind of defines you as you, right? You know, like uh, Garcias always have you know um, particular kind of type of hair or, or something like that, and for me, it's uh, for my family, you know, it's kind of like Big nose and hairy toes are my uh, favorite traits to to look about. So if you actually look through pictures back through kind of my uh, family tree, you know, you can see that my nose basically comes from my mum and her father. And, you know, I think it kind of goes a little bit cold there for, for various reasons. Um, but you can see that there are particular traits that kind of go down through generations, right? There are also traits which often skip generations, right? Or not so much traits, but phenotypes, right? Is probably the better way of talking about it. So for example, uh, my mum and dad uh, both short, my mum was, um, and my dad still is. They're like five foot six, five foot seven, something like that. Um, both my brother are over six foot tall. But my granddad on my dad's side was, you know, before he got old and kind of shrunk when I knew him, uh, he was actually pretty tall as well. And the same for my my granddad on the other side. Right. So for whatever reason, that particular uh, trait, you know, the my, the tall tallness version of that trait kind of skipped a generation. Right. And so really, it's kind of a way of formalizing that. Right. Because it's very easy to say kind of subjectively oh you know i mean this is kind of what makes a crook look like a crook or you know a, a marquez look like a marquez and and so on um 
But really what we want to do, we want to formalize that. We want to say, okay, if you and you uh, have kids, then the probability that they'll have this is going to be X, you know, blah, 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 right? And so that's really what um, Mendelian genetics is about. And if you keep that in mind, then it becomes a bit more, I don't know, kind of manageable, I guess, in a sense. Let's see if I can get the chat up. Here we go, stick that over there. Gonna drink my coffee. Today was the first time I rode into work since I think the end of July last year. It's been a very, very long time. Anyway, so it's a bit of an early start for me today. So uh, handsome chap, obviously, Mendel, uh, Austrian monk and all that. Uh, that doesn't actually really matter too much. Um, but what really matters is that kind of Mendel, Mendel is obviously is the grandfather of genetics, right? So he's really the, the uh person that kind of kicked all this like the science off right so really what we can say about Mendel is there's a bunch of things that he contributed to science and in my opinion one of the biggest ones is that he actually used the scientific method right and so we're kind of familiar with that idea right uh now it's kind of taught us from uh at least since we start university if not earlier right that you have an idea you know, about something you formulate a hypothesis, you know, you design an experiment to test that, and then you collect data, right, to see whether your hypothesis is supported or not. Right, that's kind of like the standard way in which science is done. But before Mendel, that really wasn't the case, right? Before Mendel, it was really a, you didn't really have scientists so much as natural philosophers, at least certainly in biology, right? Chemistry and physics was a little bit more rigorous uh, than biology by that point. And so really, it was very much a matter of, you know, if you could shout louder than someone else with an opposing theory, then yours was the one that was accepted, right? And there was very little kind of formal collection and analysis of data, right? And so what Mendel really did, and I think some of his records are still kind of around, I'm not 100% sure uh, where those would be. But he actually kept very meticulous records about the experiments he did, like the crosses that he carried out and the data that he collected, right? And so that allowed him to very rigorously, right? And very uh, deliberately analyze those data and come to the principles that we now accept as just canon, right? They're you know, not even doubted, right? They are just, you know, Mendelian genetics, even as it named after him. Right, and so that was probably one of the biggest contributions that Mendel made to science is really kind of formalizing science, right? And so that transition from being natural philosopher to actually being a scientist really kind of began around when he was doing this work. And the other thing that, I mean, more related to his actual work that uh, Mendel really succeeded in doing is kind of answering pretty definitively the argument about how traits were inherited right and so before this before Mendel kind of came out with this data which was actually unfortunately largely ignored right so really he didn't get recognized for this work until the early 1900s 1904 or 5 something like that um but before he he kind of published his his data, his work, there were real two competing camps right, about inheritance. One was the idea of particular inheritance, right? So, and obviously this is ooh, like a hundred years before even DNA had its structure figured out, right? Um, and that was basically the, there were these discrete particles, right? That were kind of distinct from each other and somehow those particles uh, conferred a particular phenotype on individuals, right? And they, and so, you know, you kind of, you kind of like inherited a bunch of like little bits and pieces from your parents, right? Which made you what you were. And then the opposing camp was the blended inheritance, right? And that was really saying that, you know, if you, if you lined up the whole class virtually, right? Next to some kind of uh, measuring stick, 
you'd see that there's a fairly continuous or continuum, right? There's a there's a continuous gradient between the tallest and the shortest members of the class, right? And so it's very easy to say, oh well, height, you know, it can't be particulate, right? Because you have all of these, they have this very kind of uh, gradual gradient. Right. If it was particulate, then you'd expect it to be more binary, are you the tall or you're short? And obviously now we know why that uh, particular trait is a continuous trait rather than a discrete trait. Um, but we'll get into that uh, later on. Right. And so really he showed that inheritance was, oh, and fun thing about blended inheritance, uh, which kind of when you think about it, it's kind of a little bit laughable. Right, so if essentially if you have a tall and a short parent, blended inheritance would predict that you're exactly half the difference between the two in height. Right, so if you have a you know six foot tall and a five foot tall parent, then you all the children should be five and a half feet tall, right? And so obviously that seems a bit silly, but um, anyway, so that's really what kind of Mendel contributed, right? and. He did so via a pretty neat organism. He, well, I mean, I find uh, talking about peas a kind of dull as dishwater, to be honest. But um, the neat thing about uh, peas, other than the fact that they're, you know, they're fairly good to eat, um, is that they have very distinctive and easily observable traits, right? And so when we talk about traits, we're really talking about the thing. Right. We're not talking about phenotype, which is a version of the thing. We're talking about the thing itself, right? So seed color being the trait, yellow and green being phenotypes of that particular trait. And obviously you can have more than one uh, phenotype, just so happens that the ones he looked at, either through luck or, luck or by intent, they had two phenotypes for each trait. Actually, let's kind of bounce down to their end actually so this is every time i start talking about this stuff i'm like ah okay we've got to go over some of the language first right and so the stuff at the end right i'm not going to spend a bunch of time going through this because there's more kind of pertinent stuff to talk about but you have to understand this language it is critical so make sure that you you know what all these words mean and you can use them in the right context as well. The two that are particularly important from here, because I'm sure you're familiar with the others, is allele, right? And it's important to remember that an allele is simply a different form of a gene. It doesn't make any kind of statement about whether or not that form is functional or not, or more functional or less functional or whatever, right? It is simply a different form of a gene. You can have Pardon me. You can have a, a gene which has one single nucleotide difference in its sequence, has no effect on expression or amino acid sequence or anything. It's completely neutral. That is still a different allele, right? Even though it doesn't actually change what that gene, uh, the product of that gene does or where it's expressed or anything like that. Okay. So it's not a judgment about what the consequence of that difference is merely that it is different. And locus is where you find that gene on a chromosome, right? So it's kind of like a either a physical location, right? It's here, or it's a what's called a mapping location, which is kind of determined by doing genetic crosses and stuff like that. And we'll talk about mapping and genetic distance and stuff when we get to linkage and recombination, which if you look in the schedule, where's the schedule, 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 I think it's this one, right? This is ooh, down here. And we've got three whole lectures dedicated to linkage. So kind of good ones loins for that particular section, because that's going to be, that's going to be a, a chunk of stuff to, to work through. It's kind of fun. Again, more math. So I always say that genetics is like, the math for biologists that can't do math very well, which is kind of me. Anyway, uh, these are also important terms to know. Again, uh, these should be somewhat familiar, at least from GenBio 1 
or if you haven't done that for a while, you know, kind of gen up on these so that they're, they're, they are familiar. Um, some, I don't know why, perhaps how biology is taught in high school. Often people call heterozygous, heterozygous dominant. I don't really know why, um, but it's just heterozygous. It simply means that you have two different alleles for any given gene. That's it. Right. Obviously, one of those alleles may be dominant. Uh, it might actually not be, right? You can have two recessive alleles and you're still heterozygous because they're different. Do, do, do. Okay. Okay, so this is another important. Uh, I mean, these words, they're fairly self explanatory. But this word is a very important one because this actually gets at a central assumption that we're making in a monohybrid or dihybrid cross. So, one thing I always tell my students is that. If I tell you that this is a mo X, whatever I'm, information I'm giving you is a monohybrid cross, it can only take one form, right? Actually, it can only be bouncing around a little bit. It will have P1 generation or P generation or even P0, kind of depending on terminology, it doesn't matter which, the parental generation. It will have F1 generation and from that, you'll have an F2 generation, right? Always, always in a monohybrid or a dihybrid cross, which is really just the difference in how many genes you have involved. The P1 generation is always true breeding. And what that means is that both the parents are homozygous. And so really true breeding is, is kind of self-explanatory in a sense, right? It basically means that if you have, I don't know, two Pomeranians, right? I'm not even sure what Pomeranians look like. I think they're cute. Um, but two Pomeranians, you breed them together, all you'll ever get is Pomeranians, right? You'll never get a Schnauzer, right? So it doesn't matter how many generations you do this for, you'll only ever get the same thing out again as you do in the parents. And the reason for that is because they're homozygous for whatever traits you're particularly interested in. And so there's never going to be any new variation produced because there is no variation in the alleles, right? Both, you know, anyway. So that's really what uh, true breeding means. And it's a central assumption of monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. And the reason is that the F1 generation is always heterozygous always always right so one thing i really want to get across is that as long as you learn right, it's, it's a fairly kind of formal rigid kind of way of thinking about this right but it has a purpose which i'll get to in a little bit but as long as you remember that these are always exactly the same right you can't go wrong you know so if i tell you for example ah, oh, you know we've got uh kind of uh doing a dihybrid cross and we've got, uh, you know, dwarfs that are both grumpy and short, right? If we're like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs style dihybrid cross, then you know, because that's dihybrid cross and they're F, I'm telling you that they're F1 uh, generation, that they're heterozygous, right? And so you can work out essentially back to the P1 generation and then down to the F2 generation to figure out what outcomes you're going to get right because they're always exactly the same three generations true breeding parents heterozygous f1s and then the predicted ratio uh in the f2 generation right it's really important to remember that so these are all terms which are absolutely essential to oops you don't need to see my old data can you give an example of a hybrid? I know you gave the example of true breeding with the two Pomeranians. Right, so, um, oh yeah, there we go. So for example, if you mated a true breeding Pomeranian and true breeding Schnauzer, not sure if that would actually work or not, but anyway, it's a fun example, right? Then the offspring would be heterozygous. And so if the offspring were 
Pomeranian, right? That would tell you that the whatever traits that make a Pomeranian a Pomeranian are the dominant ones, right? Whatever alleles make it uh, make it a Pomeranian. And so essentially, uh, let's see if we can draw this up on the board. This is going to come find a fun. I've got to. Yeah, I can give you something that will traumatize you ever so briefly. So these are some of the things which are actually left from the last time I taught genetics on campus, which is kind of wild, to be honest. Right, so. Mm -mm -mm. Probably shouldn't do that. So if you've got, I don't know what Pomeranian looks like, let's prepare. I'm really crappy at drawing dogs, <laughs> as you can guess. Uh, I'm much better at drawing cats. Pigs, I'm not too bad at either. Right. And so let's say we've got a little schnauzer there. Right. So if this is, uh, I'm not going to use P because that sucks as a letter to use for uh, genetics. Um, let's use. that right this is kind of a little bit of a gross simplification to be honest but it does does a perfectly good job this is a pom that's not a brit by the way that's a pomeranian because i you know anyway and this is a schnu right what you get would be a heterozygote right because the only allele that you can get from the pomeranian is a dominant allele the only allele you can get from a schnauzer is a recessive allele, right? So those kind of combine together and that will get you your hybrid or heterozygote. So a hybrid is just a, it's kind of like a breeding term essentially for uh, heterozygosity, right? But the genetic term is a heterozygote. That's the one that is better to use. And so given the POMs are dominant, oops, Let's see if I can draw another one. These really, really are terrible pictures of dogs. Then you would expect the, the offspring, all of the offspring, right? Doesn't matter how many times you repeat this cross, how many litters they have. And as long as it's not sex linked, whatever trait that determines Pomeranian this, then it doesn't matter whether the Pomeranians are male or a female and vice versa, right? It, it's reciprocal, it'll work the same either direction. You'll always get only Pomeranians out. Does that help? Yes. Awesome. Now, if you cross these offspring together, now you get something very different. Actually, hey, look at this, we're actually doing a, a uh, cross. This is a linkage problem. Well, that's fun. Let's get rid of that. It's been on there so long, it's actually a little hard to get off. You see, aren't Pomeranians and dogs so much more fun than talking about peas? Everybody falls asleep whenever I talk about peas. Now, oops. Sorry for the kind of the jerky cam. Uh, I'm holding my laptop up while in front of my whiteboard. But at least it's bigger though, right? So if you have, let's actually do it a little bit further up. Does that mean the offspring will not show any phenotypes of the um, schnauzer? In the F1 generation, correct. Never, ever, ever. Right. And the reason for that is because the parents are true breeding. So this is homozygous dominant, schnauzer is homozygous recessive. The only way you'll see this phenotype is if you have a homozygous recessive individual. But because you're mating this with a homozygous dominant, the only genotype you can get will be a heterozygote. Right. 
And as long as you have one dominant allele, you'll have the dominant phenotype. Okay, so when we see crossbreeds that show both phenotypes, that means that they were either both um, recessive or both dominant. Um, if you're talking about the offspring, yes, then uh, so essentially it's not a monohybrid cross, right? And so this is a, a pretty gross simplification, right? Because obviously what determines whether a dog is a Pomeranian or a Schnauzer is not a single gene, right? And it's not the difference between two alleles. So don't take too much into the fact that these are two different dogs because this isn't really a good representation of reality. It was just a kind of a fairly flippant example of um, a true breeding uh, homozygous dominant, true breeding homozygous recessive. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But I mean, in actual real dogs, uh, you're looking at hundreds, if not thousands of genes and their alleles, which determine whether or not you get a Pomeranian or a Schnauzer. And, and that's why if you do cross these together, then you're going to get some puppies that are a little bit Pom and some are a little bit Schnauzer. And, you know, some have that cute little goatee thing, but have Pomeranian ears and it's all, it's a kind of wild, crazy mess, right? So I wouldn't ever imagine trying to do this with an actual real dog example because uh it just wouldn't work very well okay but, thank you that yes yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of that's why they, people use peas i guess right even though they're dull as dishwater right so if this is the f1 let's see if i can get that right i'll take pictures of these as well after after i'm done and then post them up to blackboard so don't stress too much if you can't see exactly what i'm writing or you might miss something so these, if they're F1, are going to be heterozygotes, right? Yeah, Jimena. Oh, yeah, yeah, I always think of Vampire Diaries. Hmm. I don't think I've ever watched or read the Vampire Diaries, so I don't don't get that reference. So they kind of like half vampire, half not vampire. Anyway, so from these, you get either of these two alleles, right? And actually, this is gonna be 50-50. This whole jazz here, if I can get the lid off this pen. As a bit of an aside, we're kind of bumping around a little bit here. So if you get confused, just you know, ask questions or tell me to slow down or whatever. This is the law of, you see what I'm writing? Yeah. Segregation. So this is one of Mendel's laws, which basically says which allele a gamete gets. I'll write this down in the chat in a little bit. Uh, is random. Right. One of his half vampire. Oh, half vampire and half werewolf. That sounds terrible. I wouldn't want to meet one of those in the dark alleyway. Or even just half werewolf alone. So because which gammy which allele each gammy gets is random, you have two alleles. You're gonna have two different gametes, one with the dominant, one with the recessive. They're gonna be in equal amounts and you got the same oops only one allele per gamete because they're haploid and so when you put these together you're going to get one of these two of these right because it's going to be either big a little a little a or big a and one of the small ones each right so this is your F2 generation. I've actually kind of gone and gone through a whole monohybrid cross. I didn't even intend to do that. How funny is that? Now, remember what the deal is about the dominant allele. If you have a dominant allele, even if it's only haha, one, you have the dominant phenotype. Do, do, do. 
So all of these are poms, and only this one. That uh, just looks terrible. Our schnauzers, right? And so you have a three to one ratio on the phenotypes. Genotypes, one to two to one. Phenotypes, three to one. And it doesn't matter what trait you're looking at, right? This could be, uh, I don't know, bushel size in wheat. It could be, um, I'm not going to use any human examples because they're a lot trickier to work with. Um, it could be coat color, right, in cats. Whatever it is, if it's a monohybrid cross, we're telling you it has certain characteristics. We have one gene. That gene has two alleles and two phenotypes. P generation is always true breeding, one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive. The F1 generation produced from those is always heterozygous. And as a result, will show only the dominant phenotype. You'll never see the recessive phenotype, Schnauzer in this case, in the F1 generation. You'll only see it in the F2 generation. And that's actually a kind of like a fun characteristic that you can use to uh, kind of sniff out whether a trait, a particular phenotype is dominant or recessive, right? If a trait is dominant, you'll see in every generation, typically. Fun me. Even if we're not doing them on a hybrid cross, if you look at family trees, for example, that's actually what makes kind of familial traits so fun to work with is because you can actually follow them. Um, if you have a trait which skips a generation, right? And so in this case, it would be the Schnauzer trait, right? Because in the F1 generation, you don't see it at all. And then it appears later on, that gives you a hint. It's not guaranteed, right? Because there's other stuff going on, but it gives you a hint that that trait is recessive, right? Because that's a classic uh, not trait, phenotype, sorry. That's a classic uh, sign that a phenotype is recessive. Anybody got any questions about any of my absolutely terrible dog drawings? Really, truly, I'm way better at cats. I'm not, I'm not a completely uh, awful artist. I just have a very, very limited repertoire. Does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? And then again, I'll take pictures of this uh, either when we're done or, or if I need to use a board again before I raise the board. Cool. Okay, and one, one thing I always tell students is that you really need to get a monohybrid cross down, right? Because a dihybrid cross is pretty much the same thing again but we're just dealing with more stuff. And so it can easily get overwhelming, right? But the principles are exactly the same again. And so you're probably thinking, oh, oh yeah, I'm on a hybrid diabetic cross. They, you know, they're pretty dull, right? So the the real, and really in, in I don't think I've, I've never done a monohybrid cross or diabetic cross in, in the lab in terms of science. And I've been doing genetics for 20 odd years. But these are very, very valuable, not because these are things that we do to discover, you know, something It's like, oh, look at that. We've got a three to one ratio again, right? The reason that monohybrid and di particularly dihybrid crosses are important is that they provide a very uh, airtight framework to test assumptions, right? And so when we do a mono or dihybrid cross, particularly a dihybrid cross, we have a set of assumptions that we're assuming, hence assumption, uh, hold true, right? We don't actually know, right? So these actually allow us to test whether our assumptions are correct or not. And you know what they always say about uh, assume, right? And so assumptions 
of, oh crap. This is going to be a little bit torturous, sorry. My finger is actually doing really well until uh, one of my little foster puppies managed to get his mouth around it and uh, opened it up again, a little turd. He didn't mean to, he just likes biting stuff, unfortunately. All right, first one is no mutations, right? And these are, these are important assumptions and, and we'll be, we'll actually later on be seeing how you can break these assumptions potentially in these kind of crosses. And so basically that means the alleles you start with are the ones you end with. Oops. Right, so if you're doing a monohybrid cross, you know, you got one gene, two alleles. You don't, by the end of it, end up with three alleles because that, that would completely screw everything up, right? Another important assumption is that sex is random. Well, really, fertilization, because sex isn't necessarily random. That would be kind of weird. But fertilization is random, right? So um, no preference in terms of sperm or oocytes, right? So you don't, it's not the case that, you know, some sperm are fitter than others. They make it to the, the oocyte before others do, because that, again, that would mess things up. I'm drinking seven month old coffee. Isn't that crazy? I need to buy some new stuff and bring it in. Third one is no selection. Right, and so by selection, we mean there are no external pressures affecting the inheritance of a particular allele, right? And so uh, a good example is that, you know, the alleles all uh, have the same fitness or even alleles and genotypes. Oops. And that might be a bit of a weird one to think about, right? Because it's like, well, you know, how can you have selection occur in, in such a short time frame, right? From one generation to the next. And so a really good example would be a, a trait where the recessive, the homozygous recessive genotype is lethal. And so if you did a monohybrid cross with that, well, A, it would be very difficult, right? Because the homozygous recessive parent would be dead. Um, but even if you were able to do that cross somehow, then in the F2 generation, you would never see the homozygous recessive uh, genotype and you wouldn't see the recessive phenotype, right? And so that would completely screw up your, uh, your three to one ratio because it would just be three. Right? There'd be no one. Okay. Another one. Each allele segregates randomly into the gametes, right? And really, that is the law of oops, segregation, right? And so that's uh, monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. It applies to any kind of uh, reproduction, exactly the same deal, right? And so really what that's telling you is that if you have two different alleles, then there's an equal chance that you'll find one of them versus the other in any given gamete, right? So if you produce two gametes, then you'd expect, according to probability, there'd be one in, of one allele in one and one allele in the other, right? Might not work that way because biology is random, right? But if you look at, say, 100 gametes, you'd expect roughly 50 and 50 uh, of each. And then the fourth one is a really important one, and it really applies uh, solely to dihybrid crosses, right? Is that I always struggle to put this in the like not sound like a lawyer when I write this out. Um, I'll do this. Uh, let's put it this way. Basically, which allele you get for one gene in a gamete. Right, so remember, uh, if you have two different alleles, 
they should be random, right? Which one for any given gene, which one you get, right? So if you get a particular one from one gene, that doesn't have any effect on which allele you get for a different gene. Better gene. Uh, and that is the law of independent And I'm writing these down in the chat box because I really want you to have those as like a um, a list that you can refer back to again, right? I don't want it to rely on kind of like whether you're taking notes or not, what kind of context you're in, because these are really important. And so really what you do is you, you use, let's say, dihybrid crosses in particular, and you'll actually be doing one of these. You're going to in lab, I'm pretty sure you are in, in Mr. Penny's as well, but I'm definitely going to be in my lab, you're going to be doing a, um, not a dihybrid cross, right? It's going to, it's a different kind of cross, but you're going to be doing a cross between uh, uh, essentially two different genes, right? And so we're assuming that what allele you get for one of those genes has nothing to do with what allele you get for another gene. Pardon me. And what you'll actually see is that's a that's an incorrect assumption, right? And so the point of these assumptions is that you do things in a very particular way, dang, 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 dang. And if you don't get what you expect, right? And we can test that formally with like a chi-squared, which we'll be covering uh, in a lecture soon. If you don't get what you accept, expect, that's telling you that something else is happening. And that something else that's actually the interesting thing that you're looking for, right? It's like, okay, so we don't get what we expect. Which assumption is wrong, right? How can I figure out A, which assumption is wrong and B, why it's wrong, right? What's going on, right? That's actually what's the interest, what is the interesting part of uh, doing these kinds of crosses, right? And that's really what, uh, where the power comes from these. All right. Anybody got any questions about any of this so far? If you have some that you can't quite formulate because you're not entirely sure what you question you want to ask, just write those down and bring them with you on Friday. Okay, so just got only a few minutes left. It's not really enough time to kind of properly get into um, the next bit, right? The next bit that we're going to be covering is uh, a test cross, right? And so I just want to put a worm in your ear and ask you, for any of these particular phenotypes, right? For the dominant phenotypes, uh, let's say round seeds, how can you figure out what the genotype is? Actually, here's another question. So a question to class, which is the only phenotype for which you can definitively state in absolute confidence what the genotype is? The only one, does anybody know? Which phenotype can you state what the genotype is? Kind of going backwards. All right, we're talking about the recessive phenotype. Because the only way that you're going to see the recessive phenotype is if you have a homozygous recessive genotype, right? For the dominant phenotypes, they can be caused by either homozygous dominant or heterozygous genotypes. And so really the, the, 
The question is, how would you figure out which of those two is the correct genotype for that phenotype, right? And so that's what we'll be going into on Friday. It's called a test cross. We've got it laid out in the, the PowerPoint if you want to kind of go through and look at that in more detail. And that's pretty much it. I don't really have anything else that I've got time to get into uh, today. Does anybody have any questions about anything that we've covered so far? So this um, list that you've typed into the chat, uh -huh. um, these are just assumptions of mono or dihybrid crosses? Correct. Yeah, so. so and there's only there's only five. There's no more. These are just the standard in genetics or. I don't think there are any more. Can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, but if I do, I'll let you know. Um, so the the last two apply very specifically. Well, the last yeah. I mean, typically when we're talking about the last two, we're talking about monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, right? But really, they apply to all. Uh, they apply to all crosses. They apply the same to test crosses. The same principles really apply whatever kind of cross. You're assuming that the alleles are segregating randomly, right? There's no reason why you get more of one allele than another from a heterozygote. And the, the, all the genes involved in the cross are acting independently. So they, they do pretty much apply uh, to all crosses. Uh, but the last two are kind of like the formal formalization of the monohybrid and the dihybrid cross, right? So the monohybrid cross really illustrates the law of segregation very well. And the, the dihybrid cross does a very good job of illustrating the law of independent assortment. Uh, but yeah, they, they typically apply to all crosses, right? You wouldn't, you're assuming that all those things are apply, you know, are working that way uh, in any cross you do. And then it's really, if you don't get what you expect, whatever that might be, depending on how you design the cross, then that's telling you that something funky is going on. And I've got plenty of examples of that, you know, tearing my hair out, like wondering why I'm not getting what I, I should be getting. So it does, does happen a lot. But yeah, I'm pretty sure there's only five. I'll have to double check again. I can't think of any others that would that would you know, really apply, to be honest. Sure. But they're good ones to keep in mind when you're going through this, because they are very formal kind of uh, tests, essentially, that you're carrying out, even if you don't realize it at the time. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that was fun, uh, particularly using a proper size whiteboard for a change. That's always a plus. Um, and I'll post these things up uh, maybe before lab. If not, I'll definitely put them up after lab. Uh, and for the people who are in the lab B section, I will see you in about an hour and 10 minutes. The law of gravity, etc. Are these laws for genetics? Oh, are these. I was going to say, I'm not sure gravity is all that important in doing a genetic cross, other than like getting things together. Um, yeah. So these these laws are the laws of Mendelian inheritance, right? So uh, the law of segregation, the law of independent assortment, and there's another one as well. I can't remember what that is. Law of dominance, I think. Uh, so that one one allele will be dominant over another. Those are what we would call the laws of uh, of Mendelian inheritance or Mendelian genetics. Definitely, we have other things which we call dogmas, which are just taken to be given, and those have their own various merits as well. Cool. All right. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I will see you either this afternoon or on Friday. Stay safe.